Okay, so I think I'll get started. So uh, welcome to our Digital Scholar webinar. This is hosted by the Southern California Clinical and Translational Science Institute, University of Southern California, and also at Children's Hospital LA. My name is Eric Peterson. I'm an Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences here in the Keck School of Medicine at USC. I'm also the co-director of Digital Recruitment and Scholarship within the SCCTSI. So today we are going to have uh, very engaging speakers and um, we encourage you to please use the Q&A feature, but also the chat feature on Zoom. Everyone should know how to use this by now, but um, you can either do the chat or the QA. We'll monitor both of those and any questions you have as they come up, please type them in. Um, you can also, uh, you can wait till the end, but it'd be great if you can just throw them in there whenever they come up <clears throat> and we'll get to them uh, throughout the talks as well as at the end. So we are excited today to have um, three members from POWER, which is a tool to help patients uh, connect directly with leading medical researchers within this clinical, modern clinical trial marketplace, which uh, the speakers will tell you about today. And so uh, Brandon Lee is our featured speaker. He's the co-founder of POWER. Uh, he graduated from the University of Toronto, studying industrial engineering, operations research, machine learning, and user experience design. Uh, he has a background in building technology products and businesses that help remove the friction for people as they navigate these traditional opaque industries. And we're really excited to hear uh, from Brandon as well as from John and Vana. And so I'm just gonna turn it over to you guys. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Eric, thanks for uh, for having us, Karen. Thank you for um, for setting the stage here um, and appreciate the introduction. So uh, we'll, we'll get started very shortly just um, by way of quick intro. My name is Brandon. I'm one of the founders of Power, joined here by uh, two of my amazing colleagues, uh, John and Vana. Um, who, who lead a lot of our uh, partnerships and strategy work um, that we do here at, uh, at Power. So uh, maybe I'll start with a high level of what is Power before we jump into some slides, um, and then we can uh, roll in from there. But at a high level, uh, Power is what we call a modern clinical trial marketplace. If you had to remember this and maybe one tagline, the way to think about it is um, we've built the Airbnb of clinical trials. We've basically built the most patient-friendly, patient-centric way for individuals who are excited to learn about research. Um, we've created a, a space for them to go and learn about that research and then get in touch with those researchers directly. So um, the way that you should be thinking about this is we have a lot of patients who are using the website already. Uh, we're actually one of the fastest growing websites that's ever been launched in clinical research. Um, these patients are joining every single day to try to learn about research. And now as uh, those researchers, those sites, those sponsors sign up on our website, we're able to connect the dots there and help uh, individuals actually uh, match into research. So uh, with that said, I will share my screen and get going. Like I said, Power, we are a modern clinical trial marketplace. Um, I think five things that we really want to cover today. Um, the first one is uh, just an overview of where we're coming from. Um, what are some of the problems that we see in clinical trials today? Everybody talks about recruitment as a challenge. Um, what are the, the challenges with traditional patient recruitment? Uh, the second thing is understanding, okay, we I, I keep saying this word, modern. Uh, what is a modern clinical trial marketplace? What does modern patient recruitment mean um, uh, at all? We'll kind of double click into um, how we think about that. The third one is, um, actually, we'd love to just show folks rather than telling. Uh, so we'll do a quick demo of the platform. Uh, fourth, um, we'd love to then talk about specifically, uh, what does recruiting with power feel like if you're a uh, um, if you're a PI, if you're a clinical research coordinator, if you're conducting research out, um, out there um, and trying to connect with patients. And then lastly, creating the space for Q&A. And I want to call out that Q&A doesn't have to happen at the end. Uh, like Eric was saying, if you have questions, comments, anything uh, that you would like to know, please feel free to drop it in the chat, drop it in the Q&A, and the team will um, ping me and, uh, and interrupt me, hopefully, uh, to let me know that there are questions that uh, folks want answered. Uh, so if that all sounds good as an agenda, we can uh, jump into part one. What are some of the problems uh, with clinical trial recruitment? Actually, before we do that, um, maybe just a quick introduction to the team. So um, uh, the way that we think about uh, the team that we've brought together here is we've brought together really uh, a background in consumer technology, building kind of this Airbnb style um, platform, healthcare technology, as well as biopharma. So um, alongside the uh, the three folks here, we're also joined by um, Jeff Kindler, former CEO of Pfizer, uh, Quita Highsmith, who is uh, who is the uh, chief diversity officer at Genentech, Murray Abramson, who ran clinical operations at Merck and Biogen, and Jason Monteleone, who has run a handful of um, global CROs. Um, so these folks bring um, the perspective from diversity to clinical operations to um, 
uh, the drug development that really help us um, make sure that we're building a platform that's not only helpful for the patients, uh, but also helpful for the folks and the researchers that are doing the work to uh, connect with those patients. So um, as we think about patient recruitment, um, we'd love to start with actually just uh, a framing of the problem. Um, as everybody here would deeply understand, patient site sponsors, everybody has a strong desire to engage with each other. Um, but unfortunately, it's a bit of a struggle because the system today is quite difficult. Um, so some of the systemic issues in patient recruitment that we see today, um, kind of threefold. The first one is awareness uh, being limited. Um, most of the required stakeholders, none of the required stakeholders um, are able to easily find each other today and make the first connection. The kind of best platform, the best kind of comprehensive platform we have out there is clinicaltrials.gov. And um, I probably am not uh, surprising anybody when I say this. Um, if you ask any patients out there uh, what the experience is like looking for a trial and trying to connect with um, individuals and using clinicaltrials.gov, um, usually you get um, uh, pretty frustrated responses. Um, the second systemic issue that we see often is that the, the journey of actually connecting with these patients and enrolling them in research is quite disjointed. So um, patients cite sponsors only to coordinate with each other, um, but there's this kind of fragmented set of processes, software, technology, call centers, email, um, text message uh, that all gets intermingled in a way that uh, unfortunately lets people fall through the cracks. And the last one is just that reporting is inconsistent. Um, so the data today is uh, often manually tracked, reported um, in spreadsheets, and as a result, it's hard to make uh, comprehensive strategic decisions uh, in real time. Um, uh, the way that we uh, see a traditional patient recruitment, um, we define it as maybe three kind of primary approaches to patient recruitment. The first one is clinic-led recruitment, right? This is um, uh, engaging with all of y'all. Uh, doing research in the clinic, at academic centers, in the community, um, essentially hoping that there are established patients uh, in the clinics um, or that there are a set of new patients that may walk in the door uh, down the road uh, to participate. Unfortunately, we've all had the experience where um, this doesn't quite uh, ever really reach the levels um, that uh, we all want when uh, when we embark on a on a project. The second one is paid digital marketing, right? Facebook has, Facebook advertising has been around forever, um, but then the complaints are also um, quite standard around there being, you know, patients that don't have a lot of intent. Um, they kind of forget what they signed up for um, in the uh, in the first place, and they're not really excited about the idea of being sold uh, clinical trials. Um, and then the third piece is just going through patient databases, registries, and trying to reach out to uh, a large list of uh um, of patients. And um, for a lot of the folks who are on the ground, namely uh, research coordinators, um, this can be a lot of um, legwork, uh, working through potentially outdated leads, outdated lists of patients. Um, it can be quite time uh, sensitive or time intensive along the way. So that, that's how we think about patient uh, recruitment today and the problems um, that what we've heard uh, folks kind of face on the ground. Um, one of the most interesting things that has happened though in the in the recent past is that patients are increasingly trying to help themselves and learn about research themselves. So we've actually seen uh, patients looking for trials. This number has grown 22X in the last seven years. Uh, and in fact, more than half of patients who end up looking for trials uh, start in a self-directed way online. So um, whether that's looking on Google, looking on Bing, Yahoo, DuckDuckGo, or um, starting to uh, try to figure out where there are disease-specific um, foundations or advocacy groups or websites that they can start finding information on. Um, more than half of the people uh, out there learning about research do it uh, on their own um, online. And that shouldn't surprise anybody. I think that if uh, if I asked uh, this group, you know, what's the first thing you would do if you wanted to learn about research, you'd probably say that you'd Google something. Um, and that's actually what most people do, unsurprisingly. So um, if we take these two things together, right, this idea that, you know, traditional patient recruitment um, is kind of tired and not really hitting the goals that we want, and that there's this new wave of patients who are increasingly uh, trying to take control of their own care, I think that there's a, um, a need and an opportunity to evolve the way that we approach patient recruitment and connecting with patients online. So um, this chart kind of shows uh, the evolution of strategies of engaging with patients uh, on the x-axis and on the y-axis um, we've got kind of the degree of uh, patient centricity and how uh, closely we are engaging with those patients where they are and in their needs um, 
And I think that what we're what we're seeing is this uh, this shift uh, from what we're calling calling outbound patient recruitment, essentially trying to identify patients and reaching out to them and and you know nudging them and selling them on on, um, on trials towards what we're calling inbound patient recruitment, which is really this idea that there are patients out there that are interested in research. We actually just have to cast the net appropriately, find those patients and bring them into the right places for those conversations. And those patients are the most empowered, the most engaged, and the most interested um, in research um, and participation. So one of the things that uh, we take inspiration from here is just that uh, we can learn from others. Um, there have been uh, amazing platforms that have uh, come out in the last 10, 20 years that have really helped us navigate traditionally potentially impossible transactions in the real world. So, you know, 15 years ago, um, it would have been impossible to uh, think that you could fly to Boulder, Utah and stay in this cave that somebody apparently owns and wants to rent out to you. Uh, you have no idea how you could do it. Um, but today with the advent of uh, Airbnb, um, that's actually really easy uh, to go and navigate. Um, and that's exactly what we want to do to uh, to clinical trials. So we want to, we, we want to be a part of this paradigm shift, I think, where um, historically, uh, the way to go find patients is um, finding lists of patients and reaching out to them and uh, and and having to engage them one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, towards a model where, you know, we're actually democratizing access to information about clinical trials and then democratizing access to the researchers themselves where you can connect directly with those patients who might be interested in participating in your research. So modern patient recruitment, um, what, is, what is modern about it? How do we think about modern? Uh, well, I think there's a few things that need to be true um, about uh, this new world for it to be modern. Um, in particular, we probably want to reframe recruitment from being this top-down vendor-based activity um, where you're really kind of going after um, uh, large lead lists that have low conversion rates um, towards something that's patient-centric. Um, that's uh, not only patient-centric, but also uh, offers the ability to continuously connect with new patients as they express interest in research. And you can kind of meet them exactly when they express their interest and collaborate um, all in one place. So as we see it, there's three defining characteristics of a modern clinical trial marketplace. The first one is that um, at the end of the day, the idea of a marketplace um, needs to uh, include uh, an ability to verifiably have these patients successfully show up and enroll in trials. Um, Airbnb would be useless if people don't actually show up um, and stay in the homes. Um, in the same way, a modern clinical trial marketplace would be useless if patients don't actually show up um, and participate in the research. Um, the second thing I think is that uh, it's actually a three-sided, um, uh, it's a, it's a three-sided um, platform in that there are kind of three stakeholders that probably need to be involved. Uh, on some level. So the first stakeholder being patients, of course. Um, the second stakeholder being sites and the teams at sites, uh, PIs, CRCs, the folks doing the research. And the third one being uh, sponsors, especially in uh, an industry context. Um, I think all three of these folks um, need to be active um, on a platform uh, like this for, the, for, uh, for it to be successful. Um, and in particular, um, what we envision is that these three groups would um, collectively choose to use the platform uh, because in doing so, it actually makes the whole system easier. It makes it easier to do recruitment um, for everybody involved. And if that's the case, we've got this mutually reinforcing uh, what we're calling a network effect um, that allows uh, patients to more successfully connect with researchers, researchers to more successfully recruit and sponsors um, to have their trials go faster. Uh, and then the last piece is that a marketplace like this needs to reduce friction with the use of technology. And um, one thing that we've heard consistently uh, from patients, uh, from PI, CRC, sponsors, clinical operations is that um, there's just too much friction today in the way that uh, patients learn about research, get connected with researchers, and ultimately show up to um, participate. Um, and we believe that a, a single platform that is three-sided, that has these three stakeholders all in one place, um, can introduce the technology tools required in order to stay in sync, um, standardize uh, processes, um, and bring um, a, uh, a really exciting reduction in, uh, in friction. Actually, one example that kind of comes to mind is um, imagine a world where um, patients can uh, can can book a uh, initial con like phone consultation with uh, um, with the research team. Right, they don't have to uh, like express interest and go back and forth via email and then uh, sign uh, find some time um, to have that conversation. 
Um, I think there's a, a million and one actually small things we can do to reduce friction along the way. So this is what we think of um, in terms of three sides. Um, I've said it a few times, but step one is that patients are out there looking for trials. And in particular, they're using our website with power.com every single day to look for those trials. Uh, step two is that we work with uh, the trial teams um, to differentiate their profiles on power so that uh, patients can learn about the research, um, understand why it's interesting or exciting or why the team believes in it um, and the hypothesis um, that tends to drive patients to be um, uh, interested in learning more. And the last one is that then patients can, can connect with the sites and the locations and the, the researchers themselves for the purposes of actually participating. So um, that's kind of the three steps um, in getting uh, patients through the flow and the way that we think about these stakeholders interacting with each other. And the results have been amazing. So we've been doing this for almost a year and a half now. Um, and what we've seen is that patients are already using power uh, to an extraordinary degree. So we have almost 40,000 patients, uh, actually north of 40,000 patients, uh, searching for trials on our website every single month. We're on pace to have more than 600,000 patients this year uh, look for trials. We've had north of 900 actually teams at this point at, um, at sites. Uh, that includes all the major academic hospitals um, in the US. Um, uh, we've had teams across all of them sign up uh, to start connecting with patients, start listing their trials um, and start uh, um, broadcasting the really important work they're doing. And then we've supported more than 400 uh, studies at this point in some way, shape or form. Um, so we're really proud of the impact that we've had in the um, first year and a half of uh, of being here. And um, we're excited to continue growing and um, making sure that we're supporting patients and researchers um, along this journey. So uh, this is the portion where I jump in and show you a little bit of uh, what I've been talking about. But before we do that, I just want to pause and see if there's any questions um, in the audience um, uh, that we may want to address before I jump into this uh, demo section. Oh. Anyone? I think we have the ability to, oh no, we don't have the ability to do um, audio, but yeah, just if anyone has any questions, just put them into the chat or Q&A as uh, Brandon's going. I think I see a hand up in the uh, attendees uh, that yeah, keeps going on. If someone wants to speak, I can certainly uh, uh, oh. allow them to speak. Praveen, did I see your hand up? Allison had her hand up, I know. Oh, sorry, I just uh, pressed it by mistake. I was trying to check if anyone was there in the chat or QA. Ah, okay. Hi, it's Allison. I see the chat's disabled. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm just wondering about um, any like extra support. Maybe you'll get to this in the demo, but in addition to listing trials, are there any additional resources or facilitation that you provide to the sites? Uh, what do you mean by research, uh, resources and facilitation? Like, I don't know, flyers or uh, a, a site where uh, once a participant indicates interest, the site can then communicate with them like in a different platform. Gotcha. Yeah. So let me jump into both of those things. Um, and I'll actually just queue it up in the demo here so it's a little bit smoother. Um, but the question was, what are the other resources that we provide? Um, on the uh, on the site side, um, and actually, there's also a question in your chat now too, Brandon. Gotcha. gotcha. Um, so, uh, what are the resources we provide on the site level? Um, there's a couple things that I'll kind of preview that uh, there's a digital pre-screener, especially for um, uh, some of these academic studies. Uh, we're actually offering it to academic studies um, in a really uh, cost-effective manner for you to create your own digital pre-screener that, that patients can kind of answer and you can kind of screen um, the patient's results um, pretty easily. Um, and then uh, we also have a, a platform in the back end to, to manage all that, uh, that process. Um, so I'll walk into that um, as a part of the demo. And one other question here, Maria, 
what is the social demographic of the individuals interested in the platform? That's a really great question. And um, I think we we may have a slide in here uh, later uh, that talks a little bit about uh, diversity. Um, but the high level is that actually we're seeing a really diverse um, cross section of uh, patients who are using our platform. In fact, um, we're representative roughly of the US population, roughly 40% non-white um, patients are actually signing up to use the platform to connect with clinical trials. Okay, I have indicated that I have answered it live. Okay, um, perfect. Well then, uh, with that said, why don't we jump into the demo and then I'll make sure, Allison, that I've touched on some of the uh, the topics you've asked about. Okay, I am now sharing my screen again, but I have our website up, yes? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so uh, this is our website, it's our homepage. Um, as you can imagine, or as you can see, um, immediately, this is a way more user-friendly, beautiful, intuitive way to start your search uh, to look for clinical trials. But, you know, it's not just a search bar. Um, there's a lot more to it. But let's uh, let's start with a search here. So let's imagine I'm a patient and I'm looking for uh, trials in lung cancer. I can start the search for lung cancer and immediately see, um, hey, here's a bunch of trials uh, that... Um, are currently recruiting uh, for lung cancer. I can toggle around placebo. It's currently toggled for uh, trials that are recruiting as a patient. That's probably what I'm most interested in. Um, we can also filter by location. So right now I'm in uh, Europe. So it defaults to Halifax, Canada, one of the most easternmost um, locations that uh, we could find. Um, but let's go, uh, let's go Los Angeles because we're talking um, about USD here. So um, we're going to Los Angeles. We don't want to travel more than 50 miles um, for lung cancer. One of the interesting things that we do here actually is that we have on the left-hand side this filter bar and you can interact with as much of the filter bar or as little. One of the things we know about patients is that uh, there's a distribution of health literacy um, and comfort with different terminologies. So um, rather than uh, forcing patients through the exact same process, we've decided actually to build a more flexible experience um, in this filtering that allows patients to engage um, at the level that they understand. So, you know, one of the things that immediately prompts you with is, uh, hey, this is lung cancer. Do you know if it's non-small cell or small cell? Um, let's imagine it's a non-small cell. Um, actually, you can see now where there's two criteria uh, that are matched uh, for each of these studies. And we start to kind of rank studies based on um, the kind of match uh, based on the filters that patients are telling us about themselves. Um, one of the things that, you know, patients actually uh, uh, tend to have a, a decent grasp on is any biomarker information if they've been, uh, if they've had their um, their sequencing done. Um, we've actually seen over and over again that uh, patients have had conversations with their oncologists about um, these biomarkers. They may not know exactly what uh, all of them mean, but um, they certainly have heard these things before. So um, let's imagine a uh, patient is PL1 positive. Okay, now there's actually three criteria matched for uh, the top studies that are being recommended, these top 25. Um, uh, so uh, here's a handful of studies that can be considered. Um, this one's recruiting. There's actually a check mark in there. Um, uh, it turns out it's actually happening at USC uh, as one of the, the listed sites uh, for this study. Um, patients can kind of learn a little bit more about the study. And if they want to see more information about it, uh, we take patients to what we call kind of like a, a study page. So this is um, a study profile. This is what um, uh, the study teams can really own and add to um, as a part of uh, communicating with patients um, uh, about the, the kind of research that they're doing. And there's a couple of things that um, study teams are starting to add to this platform um, that allows them to, you know, just educate patients who are interested in a really like meaningful way. So the first one is video summaries. Um, a lot of patients are finding um, that video summaries are helpful and patients are engaging in some of this stuff. So um, study teams are uploading uh, videos that they've created, videos that are uh, on YouTube that are relevant, and even PIs are creating uh, videos themselves um, that they're um, uploading to this website as well. One of the things that we know that patients uh, often look for um, is what is, you know, some of the prior research look like here? Um, why are we excited about this research? And oftentimes they'll actually go looking in the literature to try to figure out um, what is out there. And one thing we do is actually create the space for uh, the study teams to upload information that they've previously published uh, about this, uh, um, the research that they're doing um, in a way that uh, patients can start to engage with that information up front. And how I see a, uh, a question about um, demographics. Uh, 
question. So the question is, um, uh, the question is around uh, demographics. Uh, I'll actually get into that in a second. Um, and then Praveen um, is asking, uh, we made sure your application will take less than five minutes. Uh, this means the screening form, yes. Um, and actually I'll, I'll show everybody what that screening uh, kind of looks like uh, uh, shortly, but essentially, um, we create all of this stuff uh, for patients to try to understand a little bit more. And we try to explain what these different groups are. Um, we try to explain the trial logistics. Um, what does it take to kind of participate? Um, and then we try to show, hey, here's the locations. Um, maybe I was looking in Los Angeles, but uh, as I think about it, I actually have family in uh, like near Portland or something. Um, it might be more, um, or I should say Eugene, Oregon. Um, it might be easy for me to, to actually consider this site as well. Um, so we create this kind of interactive map search um, that allows patients to really take a look and understand um, where things are. Um, if patients are interested in participating um, and contacting the team, um, they click uh, apply now. Um, for all intents and purposes, this helps patients go through a contact flow. Um, this is a pre-screener. Um, we don't need to go through um, the entirety of the pre-screener. It works exactly as kind of like a survey um, might work as you would expect. Um, but we collect a bunch of information from the patients. Um, that information is actually customizable. These pre-screeners are customizable for the study teams. Um, so you can start to make an assessment as to whether patients um, are likely to be a good fit uh, before you reach out. Uh, and this is uh, going a little bit to the question that um, Allison had, um, which is, okay, well, what kind of platform um, offering do we uh, do we have for the study teams? Um, this is the back end. So um, what I just showed you was the patient experience. Uh, patients that are out there looking for research, they're signing up for our website all the time. Um, then what we do is um, when they sign up for a study and they fill out a pre-screener, um, they show up here. Um, this is kind of the queue of patients that are uh, that are interested in your trial potentially and don't have to worry about this. This is all kind of dummy data um, that we've kind of put in. Um, these are members of our team. Um, but you can see, okay, here's the patients. Uh, they've kind of answered 100% of the questions correctly uh, in the pre-screener. Um, this is how you would contact them. Um, and here's the, the status. Uh, maybe they're a new patient or maybe um, we've contacted them, we need to follow up all the way through to uh, they've actually enrolled in the study. Um, and that can help you stay on top of the uh, the process of uh, working with all these patients. In particular, one thing that's interesting is if you click into the patient's profile, and we actually show you um, the questions that they answered. Um, so these are the questions that they answered uh, in the pre-screener, and you can see yes, unsure, or no, um, and make a determination as to whether um, this patient is you know, likely to uh, be a good fit and whether you'd like to actually reach out to uh, try to coordinate a little bit more time uh, to discuss the study. So that kind of brings us to the end of the demo. Um, hopefully I addressed Allison's questions um, and hopefully I addressed Praveen's questions. Praveen's questions. Perfect. And then uh, I'll actually switch back to the, uh, the slideshow now um, because I think there's a, a component of this that's actually uh, that directly talks to, I think, some of the uh, demographic questions. Um, and this is an anonymous question, so I, I don't really know how to address um, who asked it. Um, uh, but uh, actually, as I'm reading this, maybe it makes sense for me to just address it directly. So um, age, socioeconomic status, um, we don't collect socioeconomic status um, when patients create profiles. We do collect age. Uh, the distribution of age is really interesting. Um, I think a lot of the uh, assumption around a platform like this is that it might skew towards a younger audience, but actually what we found is that it's skew, it, it, it's kind of representative of the uh, disease burden. Um, so we do a lot of um, analysis on this. Um, we were actually, uh, I think, looking um, more than 70%, 75% of the patients who've signed up are over the age of 50 uh, on our website. Um, and that's kind of representative of the folks who uh, might be most engaged in looking at research. Um, so I hope, I hope that answers um, that question. Um, there's another uh, component of this, which is around uh, uh, language. One of the interesting things that we're actually doing with another health system down in LA is um, doing a little bit of uh, research on um, a Spanish translation of our website and showing that it improves accessibility um, for uh, the Spanish speaking population. And Maria is asking, uh, how do you define success and unsuccessful participant in the system? So um, I think that uh, I'm not sure at what point in the uh, in the patient's journey you're asking about, but um, I think broadly 
uh, there are two points, right? The first point is patient has expressed interest. Um, are they likely to be qualified or not? And then the second point is, have they enrolled in your study or not? Um, so um, the first piece of trying to understand qualification for the study is entirely based on the pre-screener that you've designed. So we essentially report what percentage of the questions did the patient answer right for all intents and purposes. And hopefully that gets you a little bit of a high level view as to whether this is likely to be a successful patient referral. Um, and then at the end, at the end of the, uh, um, the journey um, is, hey, did the patient enroll? And that's actually, um, you know, we've got the tooling that allows you to kind of keep track of that, report on it and um, stay on top of all of that information. I'm seeing more questions drop. So actually maybe I'll, I'll just linger here. Um, Adam asks, have you found uh, if interested participants find study through power and contact site PIs directly? Um, so we actually don't list kind of like the contact information for the PIs directly on the website. Um, the way that patients kind of contact the, the PIs and the site teams is by filling out a pre-screener. Cool. So let me uh, go, go through here. One of the things that we think about most deeply is um, how does patient centricity and the, the kind of philosophy behind the way we've built the platform, uh, how does that lead to better results for everybody? Um, and one thing that we found is that patient centricity means that patients are more engaged um, on our website relative to other sources to learn about trials. So um, here's just like a comparison against uh, some web analytics on clinicaltrials.gov. Um, we see that uh, patients on our website are anywhere from two to three times um, more engaged. Uh, this first column is pages per visit. Um, this is the number of pages that uh, the average uh, person on a website uh, look at when they uh, visit that website. And the way to think about this is um, a higher pages per visit number means that patient or people are more engaged. They're clicking around. They're actually like exploring more and more surface area on the website. Um, so more means more engaged uh, in this case. Um, you can imagine actually this number on clinical trials like is probably artificially inflated by uh, industry folks who are doing competitive research, <laughs> actually, and, and doing the most clicking around on that website. Um, uh, another way that we think about engagement is uh, time on site. So this is how long the average visitor spends on a website. Um, three minutes is actually pretty good. Um, as far as the internet goes, um, we're seeing that patients are uh, significantly engaged when they come to our website, uh, which just tells us that they're actively looking, actively considering research and quite interested in uh, learning about what, what is out there. Another interesting thing that we're finding is that not only are they more engaged, they're more likely to convert. Um, and by convert, I mean connect with the, the study teams and fill out the pre-screener. So we're, we're finding that sites that have differentiated information, information about the timeline, information about, you know, some maybe a video summary that we just um, that I just walked through, um, convert at three times higher um, than non-differentiated trials. Um, and this is uh, the site component that I was just kind of uh, showing you. Um, when we have site profiles, uh, we build more trust with patients because patients are able to assign a human element uh, to the research team at each of these sites. So one of the things that we do and one of the things uh, we'd be working with uh, all of you on is um, how do you think about showing the uh, the information about the PI, the CRC, the nurse um, that's actively working on the on the study uh, to patients? Um, how do you create these profiles? Um, and in doing so, build more trust with patients um, as they consider the study at your center. And this is just a, a, a view of the demographics. Um, so like I was hinting to before, one of the things we're most proud of is that we're seeing that this patient-centric approach to building this platform is leading to more access, more representative access to research. So um, this is a list, of, this is kind of a, a distribution of patients who have signed up on our website. You can see it's kind of, it's it's more or less representative of the U.S. population. It's actually overrepresented in uh, um, in some um, non-white populations, but uh, more or less around 40, 44% non-white um, patients. Um, as opposed to the status quo in research today, which is around 5% uh, underrepresented groups uh, getting access to research. So this is one of the stats that we're uh, most proud of here. And one of the things that um, is kind of interesting from a uh, site perspective is that uh, we actually have an ability to collaborate across multiple stakeholders uh, in real time. Um, as everybody here would know, um, time is of the essence when a patient indicates interest in a, in a trial. Um, 
this uh, process of broken telephone can really slow down the experience uh, for getting a patient uh, contacted and uh, signed up uh, to visit. Um, and as a result, a lot of patients can lose uh, just interest along the way. So um, we've created this ability to leave internal comments, internal notes. Um, think about this as like a Google document where you can leave comments and tag uh, your collaborators uh, to get responses on a certain patient's profile. Um, we have that ability in the platform. And what we've seen is that um, this uh, streamlined coordination actually allows sites to be 3.5 times more responsive uh, to patients. One of the things that we've been working on internally um, and this is very study specific, uh, is that medical record collection can often take a long time for sites. Um, uh, so we've started to roll out an ability to collect records on behalf of a patient. Um, and we've got the patient's consent to share those records um, with the study teams that are appropriate. And um, we're now able to actually take that medical record collection time from 30 days down to uh, five days and up to two days in some instances, um, where we make it a lot um, easier to kind of collect those records and um, share them with the study teams. Um, we found that in a lot of research, if this is a critical path item, um, this can often be the biggest blocker to participation for a patient. And then one of the things that's um, when we back up uh, that we're really excited about is that if we think about impact uh, through the funnel versus status quo and versus kind of the uh, the big bad like traditional patient recruitment uh, apparatus is that uh, our our kind of system here is at least 25 times more effective than what we've seen um, as, uh, as kind of benchmark. So on the left-hand side, uh, we see that patients actually convert two times better than status quo. So this is the percentage of patients who sign up uh, on our website uh, to, to learn about trials. And on the right-hand side, um, this is uh, the percentage of patients who end up um, coordinating a screening visit. And uh, what we see here on the uh, status quo is that Today, if patients learn about your study on clinicaltrials.gov and they try to reach out, about 0.7% of those patients uh, coordinate a screening visit, um, whereas on our platform, it's almost 10% of those patients end up coordinating a screening visit. And that um, kind of performance across the top of the funnel, the middle of the funnel, through to the bottom of the funnel is how we really think about transitioning from uh, traditional patient recruitment, which uh, has um, not historically been very successful towards a modern approach that uh, does have better odds of uh, delivering impact. And one of the things that uh, maybe we'll just kind of close on here is uh, a quick case study. So uh, this is a, a study that we partnered on to support um, at the highest level. Uh, two things to call out here is that first one is that we were able to um, lift the accrual rate um, of this study by 24% across the uh, the sites that we partnered with. And in particular, uh, one of the things that was most uh, impactful was actually um, the access to underrepresented groups. So roughly 80% of the patients who participated um, in this study that we had uh, referred were non-white. Um, and that was really exciting for um, the entire team that uh, was collaborating on this study. So that, that kind of takes me to the end of like the uh, the structured materials for this conversation. I think we had five minutes penciled in um, at the end here for, uh, for Q&A. But um, Eric, let me know if there's uh, another way that uh, you'd like uh, us to facilitate this. I think it's great as, as described. Um, yeah, this, is, this has been super helpful. Um, let's give people a chance to either pop into the chat, Q&A. I think we've already got some coming through. So does it work for you, Brandon, just to... Just to get those? Absolutely. Okay. Got another from Adam. Yeah, absolutely. So Adam asks, uh, what are the requirements for a study to be listed on power? Um, how do we ensure high quality research is listed? Um, so first and foremost, I think the um, the first thing we do is we cross-reference against uh, clinicaltrials.gov. Um, we don't have a, a particularly different bar from clinicaltrials.gov in terms of uh, assessment um, for uh, how trials uh, end up on our platform. Um, uh, sometimes there are uh, sponsors who want to list uh, on our website before it's live on clinicaltrials.gov, in which case we get the protocol um, uh, and the uh, the kind of IRB um, review of that uh, of that protocol. Great, thanks. Um, so we do have we do have some time. Yeah, we've got a couple minutes here if uh, if people want to continue with their questions. But um, yeah, just wondering if uh, John or Vana, you guys, anything that you guys wanted to add um, that to enhance uh, what Brandon was talking about. 
Yeah, I, I think I think it's important to note as as far as the pre-screener is concerned, we've really whittled that down to just six six questions, right? We've had a lot of success. Number one, we've gotten fabulous feedback on the pre-screener, but just those those kind of linchpin six questions that have really gotten terrific results that that you you have complete control over. The the uh, the sponsor or the or the sites can go in and edit those. We show you it's pretty easy to do once we share with you how to do it. But um go in if it's working great, you don't do it. If if you need to edit them to get a better result, then you certainly have the ability to go do that. The other thing that I would like to mention too is when you talk about the researcher view into the platform, I think it's important to note that we do have a, a, a registry, right? Where you can actually go in and search and invite patients to join a trial, specifically by indication. If these are patients that have, have applied to a, a, a similar trial that have ticked the box to say, yes, if, if, you, if another researcher comes across my profile, they have access to these linchpin questions I've been asked, if they think there's a fit, certainly have them reach out to me because I am interested in learning more about that trial. So that's gotten a lot of really rave reviews as well. Thanks, John. Yeah, and then um, you see, Brandon, there's a question about uh, cost. I wonder if you could just talk about that and then um, uh, Maria has a Yeah, question. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the way that you think about uh, cost is it's um, it's quite different. Actually, we've got an academic um, uh, partnership package um, that we can certainly explore with uh, with USC, and then we have a an industry um, uh, model as well. So um, I'll talk a little bit more to the academic side. Um, and actually, in the academic side, we've got some flexibility, um, some uh, academic grants that we're um, we're kind of thinking about um, rolling out in, in kind of partnership with uh, with researchers. So um, uh, today, uh, on the academic side, it's uh, two hundred dollars a month, uh, twenty four hundred dollars a year to be active on the platform. Um, but uh, what I'll say is that talk to us. Uh, we've got somebody on our team that works with uh, um, uh, academic uh, research teams all the time. Um, more than happy to kind of uh, connect you and um, discuss what that uh, that looks like on an individual study level. Um, or if we wanted to look at uh, a broader partnership across USC, that probably changes how we think about um, a partner across the portfolio of research that's happening um, over there. Maria asks, what are the main barriers for patients to use the platform if there are any? Um, that's a great question. Uh, what barriers do you, uh, do you potentially see here? And actually, that's actually a hard thing for me to do uh, when um, we're in this panel uh, kind of setup. Um, but if Maria, you wanted to, uh, to kind of jot down um, any barriers that you kind of see, um, would be kind of curious to, uh, to hear your thoughts. Yeah, interesting. Um, starting with not being able to continue working on the platform. You know, one of the things that we've thought about is um, how do we design a platform that's open access uh, that doesn't require kind of like a login um, to be able to start using um, just from the purpose of um, allowing people to start browsing before needing to commit to anything. Um, if you think about your experiences on Airbnb or Zillow or any of these kinds of platforms, one of the things that makes them uh, incredibly powerful is that you don't have to have an account to start using it. Um, you can start taking a look and seeing if there's something that makes sense. And then um, if you found something that makes sense, then you can create an account and um, start to engage a little bit more deeply. And that's um, that's kind of how we thought about it on our end too. Um, uh, we really wanted to, to make it easy to... Uh, uh, to start um, without a commitment, and then only asking for a commitment when um, individuals um, are truly trying to commit. Thanks, friend. Um, so I just, uh, before you get to Adam's question, um, I just put up a quick poll to people's comfort level, just really interested to see how everyone's interest level, just in terms of, I just put low, medium, or high, um, especially interested in the USC researchers and staff that are here, on the call, but um, also those that are that are outside our institution. And then, um, yeah, you want to grab Adam's question? He got another one there. Absolutely. Maybe this is, the, this is the last question we take, given I think we're at time now. Um, have we found differential success based on study type? Um, uh, yeah, actually, I mean, um, one of the things I think that is the biggest driver of um, success is uh, the indication um, that. Uh, um, researchers are, are kind of studying, right? Um, you know, we do a lot of work in oncology. Um, we have a lot of patients who are interested in oncology work, but then famously, um, the criteria are probably amongst the most complex um, to kind of navigate. Uh, the medical record retrieval system um, uh, helps accelerate the speed of kind of connecting appropriately. But um, at the end of the day, um, the complexity of the criteria, the level of self-directed engagement from a patient um, really drives, I think, where we can find the most success um, in any 
any given indication. But, you know, um, depending on uh, your study specifically, it's probably worth just having a conversation with us to um, figure out, um, do we think that it's an indication that we can have success in um, where we have active patients? We're actually happy to look at some of the data uh, together um, as you think about that. Excellent. Perfect. So then, yes, let's wrap up. Uh, I just want to say thanks so much to Brandon, John, and Vana from Power um, for being with us today. Uh, there is a link to a survey that Karen posted in the chat, if everybody could just click on that. Um, really easy, just give us some feedback on this presentation as well as any ideas you have for upcoming digital scholar webinars. Um, so we will be back in November. So look for an email from us about the, the topic that will be covered then. And any questions that people have, Brandon, what's the best way? How should they reach out to you? Just go on the website. Uh, I mean, you can uh, you can email uh, our team directly. Um, actually, John, I think I see you. Yeah, Don't yeah. So Karen, Karen and I are in touch. So if anybody has any questions or would like any more information, we are more than happy to to reconvene at whatever level necessary to make sure you have all the answers to any questions that you have. We'd love to engage and and continue to educate everybody on how we're going to change the world. Love it. Okay. Thank you guys. Really appreciate your time. Thanks everybody for being here and have a good rest of the day.